So should we change the name of our profession was a question that came up this summer in an article by Kara Scarabaggi in CYC Online. It was in the July issue and I was I was provoked to respond to his article uh, and to clarify my own position about the name of our profession. For an in-depth discussion of that uh, dialogue, if you will, I urge you to take a look at the July and August issues of CYC Online. I mentioned in that article that we now have variations on our name. We grew from child care work. My first position was as a child care counselor to a child and youth care worker because the daycare profession re-adopted the name child care certainly in North America and I suspect beyond. There is also a, also a profession of youth work that we need to recognize, very strong in Australia and some parts of South America, and that has a very particular agenda, somewhat different from child and youth care as it's evolved in North America. So I think the, the suffixes we use can change. We can talk about child and youth counselor, child and youth practitioner, professional, as well as worker. But I would maintain that we need to keep child and youth in our name. My central argument is that if we were to remove the words child and youth from our name, I fear we would remove children and youth as our central focus and their place at the core of our identity. I fear that in decentering the child by focusing more on parents, families, and communities, for example, we might also remove ourselves from our unique engagement with children and young people in their life space. And a quick story that I tell in the article in the August edition of CYC Online. There was a child in the care of our Ministry for Children and Family Development who actually died of starvation. There were five professionals involved in the care of that child, in the supervision of that child, and yet the young girl died of starvation. How did that happen? Well, what happened was every time a uh, professional came to the home, the mother would say the child is asleep or the child is sick and sleeping or the child is out. So no one actually saw the child for a long period of time. I can't believe that a trained and educated child and youth care worker would not insist on seeing a child when they visited the home. It's not enough to focus on the parent and how, what the parent may be saying or needing. We have to keep our eyes on the child. And my fear is that if we took our eyes off the child, we changed our name and we began to look at other aspects of society that other professionals are looking at quite rightly, we may well have children disappear from our sight as well. And of course, parents, families and communities are critically important. However, we approach them as context for the care and upbringing of children. So what is child and youth work, child and youth care? That reminds me of the question that came up in my very first philosophy lecture, what is philosophy? And the lecturer said, well, some people say philosophy is what philosophers do qua philosophers. In other words, it's what philosophers do when they're being philosophers. We all have private lives, we do shopping, we have families, but when we do child and youth care, child and youth care is what we do. But that's not probably a very satisfactory definition uh, for any of you. So let me give a, a, a bit of a thought on what child and youth care may mean and how we can approach it. We can and do offer definitions of different levels of generality. So for example, we can define child and youth care in a word or in a sentence or perhaps in a paragraph or in an article. Some of us even write books on the subject. And finally, I'd suggest that each of us has a career that in, in effect defines what we think child and youth care is really all about. So if you look at the life of experienced practitioners, they will tell you a lot about the nature of child and youth care work. So in a word, 
it might be a relationship. You sometimes hear people say child and youth care is all about relationship. And that has truth to it, but it doesn't again get into much detail about what we do and how we do it. So I came up with one sentence for a previous conference in 2005, and I suggest that child and youth care is how we share ourselves in care interactions or relationships in the life space of young people and families to create transformative developmental and therapeutic experiences. So there, we're there to help young people experience themselves differently and thereby develop in a more healthy manner and to deal with the trauma and pain that they might be experiencing. And I just want to say that sharing significant portions of our everyday life with young people, being in their life space, really is, I think, at the heart of the child and youth care difference. And life space is a combination of all the factors that influence a person's behavior at a given moment in time. It's not just a place or a location. It actually includes the thoughts, memories, needs, motives, personality, as well as aspects of the external environment, especially the other people in the child's world to whom the child looks to for safety, care, and guidance. So life space is quite a complex notion, I would suggest. And one can even define child and youth care in a paragraph, as is done in the North American Child and Youth Care Competencies. This is sometimes referred to as the scope of practice, and I've only put in a portion of that long paragraph for you to see the, the kinds of language that, that begins to come forward in quite complex language, like developmental ecological perspectives, um, when we try and define the scope of practice that would be meaningful to other professionals who are not in the field of child and youth care, for example. And in articles, I won't put a whole article up, obviously, but uh, my first master's uh, supervisee, Leanne Rose, who then has taught for many years at Vancouver Island University, wrote an article early in her career on being a child and youth care worker. Mark Kruger wrote Central Themes in Child and Youth Care. Jack Phelan, who you will hear in a few minutes, talks about the profession of child and youth care in an article, and I myself have an article called Child and Youth Care Unique Professions. So there are many, many articles uh, written by people struggling to define what it is we do and how we do it. And some of us even write books. So Carol Stewart's The Foundations of Child and Youth Care. Kiaris, again, with uh, two other co-authors, wrote With Children and Youth. Alan Pence and Jennifer White from the School of Child and Youth Care wrote a book on critical perspectives on pedagogy, practice, and policy in child and youth care. And there's quite a classic text written many years ago called The Social Pedagogue in Europe, Living with Others as a Profession by a number of European authors. I really like that notion of living with others as a profession. I think it gets to the notion, the unique notion that child and youth care workers share life space with young people and we bring our whole selves to interact with the whole selves of the children with whom we work. And when we talk about the career as defining child and youth care, there are many different examples for us to look to. And I've just put up a small sample, some of whom you will recognize from your own South African experiences, some of whom have visited and given presentations. And of course, I made sure that the four presenters in this uh, keynote plenary session are represented here. So some have passed away, many are still active in the field. And I think all of these people have influenced a great many people around them. So my question for you would be, what definition of child and youth care do you embody? When people get to know you and your work, what do they learn about the nature of child and youth care work from that experience? I would suggest that ultimately your career as a child and youth care worker will be your most important definition of child and youth care. As I said, you become the definition of child and youth care for others as well as for yourself. One of my favorite, a bit semi-humorous definitions of child and youth care was a worker talking about working in the school system. Uh, this young woman was a uh, school-based child and youth care worker who helped the teachers deal with behavioral issues, 
talk to parents about how they could support their child in, in the classroom and were there if the child needed them in moments of crisis or everyday moments of need. And this young woman said, I do everything except teach. And sometimes I teach, which to me really got to the heart of the matter is we do whatever it takes to support that child, wherever they are, whatever they're dealing with. So nothing is really outside our concern when it comes to the children with whom we work. So what about the notion of hope? Why do I say child and youth care is grounded in hope? By definition, child and youth care is about children and youth and young people are growing and developing persons. And by definition, they carry the future promise and hope with them. Yes, children are full persons in the moment and we work with them in the present and in the present moment. At the same time, we try and help them to learn what potential they have to grow and develop into the kinds of people they want to be, to have friends, to be productive, to have a sense of meaning, to feel valued, and so on. And hope means having trust and confidence in the future. And, and I find sometimes these days it's a little hard for me to find that with all the climate change crisis, with the kinds of violence we see around the world, uh, the economic struggles that people are going through, the COVID outbreak, which is creating pain and suffering for many people, including death. It's sometimes difficult to find that hope for the future. But what I realize is hope is not simply wishful thinking. There is no hope, and this is a quote I heard on the radio, somebody, which really struck me, without action. There is no hope without action. The way to deal with a sense of growing despair or dispiritedness is to take action, to do something. To do something for other people would be the best thing I would suggest. To get involved with an organization, to work towards a valuable goal, even if there's a very small chance that this is gonna really change very much about the world, I think to be human is to be creative and to be engaged in meaningful action. And child and youth care is certainly all about action. So I don't think child and youth care workers have to go very far to get a sense of meaning in their lives, helping young people to deal with the pain and suffering they have and to create a new future for themselves is really, I think, one of the most meaningful ways of engaging in the world that one could imagine. And I have a slide that I often put late in my presentations, which some of you have seen before. And maybe you could say it with me if you've heard this before. Child and youth care is not rocket science. It's far more complex than that. And we've seen that in the last little while with Egon Musk and Richard Branson sending tourists into outer space. We can do this, you know, quite regularly and with very little risk these days. There is always obviously risk, but much less risk than there would have been in the earliest flights. However, I would suggest that we're still struggling as a society to know how best to bring up children, to how to, how to deal with children uh, in the complexity of the world that we live in. And so child and youth care is dealing with the greatest complexities that we know far more than rocket scientists have to deal with. So never apologize for what you do. What you do, to my mind, is one of the most complicated tasks of any field or any profession. 
So at the heart of our work, it's about what we say, how we respond, what we do with children. That's our work. And what we do with parents and other workers and other professionals and the other systems. And as you will hear from Tom Garfat, in the moment. We always work in moments. We don't work in the past. We don't work in the future. Existentially, we are, as Sartre would say, condemned to work in the moment. We have no choice but to work in the moment. That's where we are with children. We can deal with effects of the past and we can create a foundation for the future, but we're always working in the moment. But I think we can take heart in the fact that much recent research on brain development demonstrates that experiencing caring moments during everyday interactions has great power and in fact can lead to positive changes in one's sense of self and behavior. So we, I would suggest we're trying to create new experiences for children, trying to experience themselves as being valued and loved, experiencing themselves as being competent, experiencing themselves as having a future that is meaningful and worth working for. And by having those different experiences, we then help them to change their behavior. That's, I think, at the heart of what our day-to-day -day work with children is all about. So in order for child and youth care to be a profession grounded in hope, each one of us, no matter how difficult it is, needs to be grounded in hope. We need to get to beyond those feelings of desperation or uh, concern about the future and find a way to be in the moment in a creative and productive sense. I'm wondering if you agree with me about this, about the importance of being grounded in hope despite all the challenges and pain and struggle that we deal with on a daily basis. What are the barriers to hope that you see? And perhaps most importantly, how can we stay grounded in hope as child and youth care workers? How can we bring hope to the lives of the children, the families, the communities within which we work? I suspect you're finding those answers. They're not easy answers to find on tough days and in tough periods of history like the one we're in right now. But I, I would suggest that at the heart of being a child and youth care worker, is finding ways to stay grounded in hope. And I wish you all the very best in moving forward after this conference and that you can carry with you some ways of thinking about the work that you're doing in a way that helps you to carry on and to support the children, youth and families and communities with whom you work. So as Don Matera would say, this is God's work and congratulations for being involved in it. Thank you. Hello everyone in uh, South Africa. I'm uh, very pleased to be invited to present at this panel on uh, the complexity underlying the simplicity of life space work. Um, my bio is, uh, is in the program. My name is Jack Phil. I'm calling from Edmonton in Canada. So what we're going to talk about today is the whole idea that we don't sit in an office and uh, and talk to people and give them advice. We basically do things with people in their life space with them. That as we do things with people, the everydayness, if you want, of what we're doing makes what we actually are doing look a little too simple. So that someone without any training in our work would see it as pretty straightforward. I'm reminded of something that Merle Alsop said years ago that it's kind of like art appreciation. It really is. Um, everybody can look at a, a piece of art and see different things. And often people that look at our work who don't understand child and youth care work just don't see the complexity there. So basically we create complex strategies and at the same time we use everyday fairly straightforward situations to support people, to help them to change. So let's take a look at some of the more complex ideas that we have really um, known as we work with people who really need our child and youth care services. Basically, most of the people that we 
to get assigned to work with have experienced fairly serious abuse and neglect in their life. And because of that abuse and neglect, they really are afraid of being too close to other people. And they're really suspicious about people who try to be affectionate or loving with them because their experience up till now has been that those are um, the kinds of behaviors, being close to people and, uh, and looking for love and affection that have gotten them into trouble. So they're not um, really receptive to people wanting to give them a big hug. Basically, if you try to give most of the young people I've worked with a big hug, they'll probably push you away or do something quite aggressive. The second complex idea is that helpers don't really have good advice for me, that most of the young people and families I've worked with see me as having a much different experience of life and different life situation than they do. So that what I think is a good idea for them really comes from my own experience where they really believe that if I actually lived their life, we, I wouldn't survive because my strategies for being successful really wouldn't work for them. A third complex idea is that we just assume that everyone believes that it's a good idea to be nice to other people. If you're nice to other people, they'll be nice to you. And most of the people who've been abused and neglected fairly seriously have really don't have the natural kind of inclination to think about other people. They're really very self-protective. They're really very unsafe in life. And so they basically only worry about themselves because it's a survival strategy. So they don't necessarily see any logic or good reason to be nice to other people which really gets in the way of some of what we think are fairly obvious behavioral strategies for them. And the last complex idea, and one that's very important for us to understand is the pain that most of the families and young people who we work with have experienced has created an enormous amount of anger in them and that it comes out often in ways that are, it seems to be very illogical or puzzling to us. And that one of the real, really important issues for child and youth care practitioners is that we have to somehow connect very carefully with the pain that people have experienced. And I think that we'll see a lot more good reasons for the anger that they have and hopefully understand that it's much more important to channel that anger than to try to control that anger. So I want to talk about the idea that child and youth care workers really, um, our main goal is to arrange experiences for people to have in their lives that really create a useful sense for them or feeling for them that we can then build on to help them move forward in their lives. And so one of the things I said at the beginning of this presentation is we don't work in an office. We don't sit there and counsel people through verbal kinds of strategies. We don't typically find that giving advice is very helpful. So what we do is live with people in their life space and create experiences while we're living with them that hopefully have useful messages embedded in those experiences so that the feelings those experiences create can be kind of used by us in a very strategic way to, um, to create new ways of thinking about the world for that other person. So what we try to do is we try to build hope in people. We try to give them experiences of closeness that are satisfying. We try to help them build their sense of trust in each other, trust in the world around them, trust in other people, so that their own sense of personal safety is expanded, so that they can basically um, move forward without kind of spending all their energy worrying about and their own self-protection. So that as we create these experiences, these feelings for the people that 
we kind of experience or co-experience that with them so that we can then kind of validate that sense of hope, that, that belief that closeness is okay, that sense of trusting um, yourself. So what we're trying to do in a, in a fairly complex way is create what we call cognitive dissonance. In other words, I have a belief that people are unsafe, but right now I'm feeling safe with my child and youth care practitioner. And that really makes me doubt my own belief so that I have this contradiction inside myself that maybe it's okay to let people get close to me. So that whole idea of talking to people through their senses, through their feelings, rather than through their brains can be very useful. I always say that good child and youth care work is talking to people's heart, not to their head. So I want to give you some um, straightforward, if you want, examples of the simplicity complexity dynamic. So we use food all the time when we work with people. So if you're working in a residential setting, you have three meals a day. If you're working in Isibindi Park, we often provide food as part of the program. Um, if you're helping people in their homes, we often help them prepare meals and help them shop for food. So food is a big part of what we do. And there's a, a colleague of mine from the United States, Mark Krieger, who used to describe food as a very complex thing. And he said, we have to think about lunch ideas when we think about child and youth care work. And he was describing, he often would describe just sitting around a table eating with a group of teenage boys. And it was very important about where you sat, who sat closer or further away from you, how you arranged the food, how you distributed it. Um, talked about how some people needed food given to them in a certain way that may seem a bit contradictory, that in many ways, food is a nurturing process. It's naturally nurturing, but it also creates resentment sometimes as you try to nurture people. So we've all, I think, had the experience of young people and families getting a bit upset, even angry with us as we try to nurture them. And what I want you to think about is they're not angry about what we're doing necessarily in the moment, but as they get that feeling of being nurtured, what happens for them often is this terrible um, memory of not being nurtured when they needed it. And again, that followed by a real onrush of anger and disappointment and about this lack of nurturing when it would have been so important for them to have received it. So that we sometimes get a fairly, what we call um, ungrateful response when we try to nurture people, when really it's, a, it's very important for us to understand that they actually are feeling nurtured by us, which is exactly what we were hoping would happen, and that their um, response to that is relatively unimportant but that the important message we should hear is that they're actually feeling nurtured. The other thing that happens with food and nurturing is some people um, can basically wear you out with there's never enough nurturing. I mean, they, they would want to drain you dry and other people refuse to accept any of your nurturing. So you have both ends often with different people, someone who just refuses to accept any of your nurturing, someone else who just drains you dry with all their nurturing needs. And we have to see again that this is a very complex problem for them. That whole idea of having them gradually helping them to get the kind of nurturing they need without either kind of starving themselves or really getting sick if you want from too much, um, trying to take too much in at once. Let me just talk a quick thing about food too, because we worry often about manners and, and whether um, people are using what we would consider good manners based on our own common sense as they accept food. And manners are very important, but in a very different way than some of the ways that we think of it. I, um, I really struggle with 
a, a message one day I got from a young person saying, Jack, you're trying to teach me to eat in a way that if I did that in, in my own family, they would be very upset with me, thinking I was trying to be better than them. So I get very angry when you try to teach me to eat the way you think is the right way to eat. So again, we have to be very aware of that, that food is a very powerful medium for the people we work with. I want to talk about play, and this is something, again, that we do fairly regularly with the young people we work with, and sometimes with the families we work with also, that play can be a very complex issue for people. One of the biggest struggles that people who have been abused and neglected have is that they lose any sense of hope in the future. Their life has been terrible up till now. There's no reason to expect it's going to get any different. So why would I try to be any different now in the present? Because it's not going to have any effect on my future success because there is no future success in my in my belief system. The other ex issue that many people have is they, they would like to be different, but they don't believe that they have any power or ability to be different. They don't believe in their own competence. And play is an excellent place to work on both hope and competence as we work with the young people and families in our, in our care. One of the problems with people who don't believe that they can be successful is that when they are successful, they very quickly dismiss it or forget it and see themselves still as basically not very successful. So one of our goals as an experience arranger is to create moments of success with people and then help them to really acknowledge that this has actually happened that they actually have experienced success and that we witnessed it with them so that it's real. It's not dismissed as just luck or who cares or it didn't really happen. So something as simple as being with a youth when he catches a fish or scores a goal or dances successfully, dances well and, and enjoys it or sings beautifully or learns to ride a bike. Um, those are the kind of things that for young people, particularly if it's a new experience for them, that we need to kind of acknowledge that with them to really play it up and to help them say, you have done something that makes you more successful, that you actually are capable of creating new successful kind of goals for yourself. It's, it's not something that um, we should dismiss easily. It seems like a fairly simple thing, but it's very important to understand that if you don't believe that you can be successful, some of these play activities that create success, drawing a, uh, a, a picture that's very attractive, can be so important to people, and we need to kind of honor their ability to be successful. The other thing about play is that Typically, play is a naturally safe place. Most of us, when we're in the process of playing, let go of our anxieties, our fears, and just enjoy the moment. So it's a really, it's a really very powerful place for child and youth care practitioners to create those moments of connection, of closeness, of being safe around me or the adult that will help the young person feel more safe and willing to connect with you as you play with them. So again, play is a very complex time. It's not just doing something in between lunch and dinner or after school for an hour before you go on to the next thing. It's a very important time to interact with uh, young people and families and to work with them well. One of the things that family support workers have found is that most parents who have experienced neglect and abuse in their own life have a very hard time nurturing their children. And so we try to get them to play more with their children. What family school workers have found is that if you just bring like crayons or a puzzle to parents and say, use this over the week and see how it works, they typically
typically won't do it very well or they won't do it at all. But if you actually do a puzzle with the parent or a crayon, you know, draw a color, um, a picture with the parent for an hour or so um, and nurture them, show them how satisfying it is to do that with someone, they'll typically be able to do that more easily with their children. So again, that whole idea of playing can be very helpful with adults too. Another issue for our ability to think more complexly is this whole idea of logic, that we all have our own logic about life. So common sense, which I referred to earlier, is merely using your own version of what you think is logical, your life logic, that everyone should think the way I do. Now, think about how Everyone's got a different logic about politics, about religion, about many, many different kinds of things. And that it really isn't very helpful to try to impose your logic on someone else. Try to have a discussion about, about politics with someone who believes in a different political group than you do. The next thing about logic is that we often think about empathy and we really are using our own logic to try to be empathic. So if I think of empathy as how would I feel if someone had abused me? How would I feel if I was in that situation? What choices would I have made? How would I feel if the teacher yelled at me and told me I whatever? So one of the things I want you to think about is that's not really empathy. That's really using your own life logic in some, and assuming that the other person shares your life logic. That really to be empathic, you have to think like a 14 year old girl who thinks it's exciting to act a certain way or a seven year old boy who kind of does things that you think are not very uh, helpful. So, that whole idea that logic gets in our way, our own logic gets in our way is very important. We often write treatment plans or, or suggest things to people in terms of what I think you need to do to live your life better. And again, we're using our own logic. I don't know how many of you are married, but I constantly giving advice to my wife about what I think is a logical way for her to change and she just refuses to um, accept my logic. We've been married for almost 40 years. I know her very well. I know exactly how she needs to think. She just refuses to um, to accept my logic. So imagine how, how self-defeating it is to try to use your logic in life on someone who you've only known for a month or two and someone who doesn't really think you have some good ideas anyway. Basically, the young people and families we work with think that we're nice people and they may in fact love to have us come and help them, but they honestly don't believe that our life logic would work in their world. Most of the young people I've worked with truly believe that I wouldn't last a week in their, in their real communities and that in fact most of the things that I think are good advice and good choices work while they're in my program but they wouldn't work in their real lives. So logic is a very important thing to think about much more complexly. So I always uh, like this quote from Albert Einstein that we really should try to keep things as simple as possible but when they get too simple they're not very helpful. So. It's easy to overlook some of the complexity in, embedded in things like food, love, play, hope, and common sense. Hopefully this little um, panel discussion will have you kind of rethink some of um, the less obvious kinds of issues around those, those things. Relationships can seem obvious. Caring for others, role modeling seem like good strategies. Affection and closeness seem desirable. But again, we have to think about how the other person experiences some of those issues. And the last thing is helping people who fear being vulnerable is not simple. They don't, they don't like the fact that people are trying to help them because they don't trust that we have good intentions. So that writing 
treatment plans, in other words, prescribing the medicine people need to take is fairly obvious, it's fairly straightforward. But what we do as child and youth care practitioners is create the willingness in people to take that medicine, use it well. So that's the issue for us. So again, we, we have a very complex task. And again, looking very simple from the outside, but as hopefully we all know, the simplicity is embedded with complex kind of pieces. Thank you very much. It's been a lot of fun to be here. Greetings, everyone. I uh, said hello more formally on day one of the conference. I'm going to press right through and uh, turn this into a bit more of a lecture. It seems that these uh, these uh, four sessions here are a little bit more um, pectoral than others. So I'll uh, do a little bit of that and see if we can uh, make sense of it at the end. I want to be talking about these 12 characteristics of service production. You'll say, what's service production? Well, I'm trying to look at how various resources and uh, facilities that are available to each residence go together along with the staff and the cost of running the place and actually produce something which is a good enough or better and even better service for young people. So instead of just providing a service, I want us to think more closely at what service production of good enough and better quality services for young people during these pandemic times might involve. I'm talking about young people being with the United Nations uh, definition, which is uh, 25 years of age. So young people up to that age is the people we're talking about. Um, I want us to think about these 12 characteristics and the main point about the social and legal mandate is that when a residence is set up, however it is set up, even if it's set up as a private place, the private place has some idea of what they're wanting to do. So there's a mandate that gives this residence authority to do something with particular children or young people and to provide residential child and youth care services for them. And the question then is by what authority? Government, an organization on their own accord, a patron, by what authority has this social and legal mandate been awarded to provide residential child care? And what limitations does it impose on the performance of workers who are employed or even volunteers to produce good enough child and youth care services in this place? The second characteristic that I'd like us to think about and be thinking about these is the kind of place that you're in. How would you answer these? 12 questions as you uh, work 12 characteristics as you think about your own particular place. Where is this residence located geographically in relation to the communities where children or young people were living? And what transport access is available for family members and others to maintain links between residents, friends and community life? To what extent does the age and architectural design of this residence and the internal construction of public and private spaces contribute to the achievement of living and learning outcomes that are identified for particular children and young people? I've heard of places that are referred to as a purpose built facility with the wrong purpose. Or this place has been adapted from something and we have no idea what's there. So. Location and architectural design of the residence is a second characteristic that must be considered. Thirdly, how many workers are engaged to produce services at this residence over the course of any given day, week or month? And what names or titles are given to the roles and tasks assigned to each worker? The more people there are, the more complicated it gets, but it covers the range from mom and dad who you agree to take on the two or three foster kids in their house, or it might be that they move into a family group home with with a half dozen uh, young people, and that is the uh, extent of the rostering of the people. Live in workers are quite common across uh, the range of services. And then how are residential child and youth care managers and workers rostered across all 168 hours of operation? 
and we were looking at that yesterday in that symposium about uh, the rosters in different ways that rosters actually make it more complicated or can work to facilitate and perform specific roles that engage residents in pursuit of, of designated service outcomes. So the more we think about this, it's a complicated exercise, but as the moves from live-in parents, house parents, into staffing, rostering in a team, then we have to take account of how that operates. Fourth characteristic, patterns in the use of time and activity. What recurring rhythms and patterns can be identified in the way that time is structured in the 168 hour week in this residence? From wake up to sleep time, transitions in the daily lives of residents, or transitions into weekdays, weeknights, and weekends for workers and residents? What activities are formally timetabled to occur for residents at particular periods of each day or week at this residence? and what unstructured or informal activities commonly occur at other times. Now, those of you who were wishing to have access to the PowerPoint presentation and the slides that are here, you'll also find that there are some specific questions in the notes that go with each of these slides that may be of use to you as you uh, go through them and try to do an exercise thinking about these 12 characteristics for your own residence. Characteristic five involves entry and exit rituals. And when we begin to think about exit, entry and exit rituals, we're talking about how people come to be arriving at this residence and how do they, how do they, how do we know about that? What are the welcoming practices that help get them there? What do we do about that? And how do we support young people uh, to arrive and feel welcome as they integrate into a living group with other residents and connect with people who live and work there. What protocols and rituals of separation inform decisions and activities around each young person leaving, or as particular living groups disband when some members leave the residence? All these are about important entry and exit rituals that we might want to think about more closely in our residence. Characteristic six involves, involves the customary practices and sanctions that we use. What social rituals and customary practices are followed with residents over the course of any day, week, month, or year at this residence? And some would say, well, what does that mean? Well, is there prayer before you have your meals? Are there times when you have karakia or prayer at the end of the day? Um, what are the social activities that go on? What are the customary rituals that happen over the course of any 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 week uh, and day? And how do residents learn about them? What behaviors might receive negative sanctions or punishment at this residence? And what are those sanctions? What behaviors are positively sanctioned or encouraged? And how is achievement nurtured? So all of these are part of that characteristic six of customary practices and sanctions. Then we think about how does the residential care workers and residents experience the physical, emotional, cultural, and spiritual safety of their living and learning environment? What's the group culture of the place? How does it feel to be, when you walk in, does it feel tense? Is there laughter? Is there feeling of welcome and warmth? To what extent does the organization of this center and work relations ships amongst the workers promote a social climate that supports positive living and learning outcomes and that we're producing for children and young people through shared experiences during the course of their placement. So the group culture and social climate of the residents is also something to think about as characteristic seven. Characteristic eight, characteristic eight thinks about links with family members, friends and community. Who are the people who live near this residence? And what potential impact does life at this residence have on neighbors? Who visits this residence? For what purposes? And who benefits from the visits? What connections and social networks are maintained or facilitated between young people living at this residence and family members, friends or schoolmates, visitors and others living nearby? Characteristic eight are the people who are connected with this residence. 
Characteristic nines is a bit more complicated criteria used to review and evaluate service outcomes. How are decisions made about who's placed at this residence? What educational opportunities are available? And where each young person will go when they leave? What service outcomes are routinely monitored and reported? How are residential care personnel recruited, trained, and supervised? And whether formal or informal, what performance reviews operate to ensure good enough quality standards of services for all residents? Characteristic 10, beliefs and values that underpin service production. What philosophy or beliefs or even ideology is given as justification for the way this residence operates? and for the standards of service this resident produ residence produces for those living here. If I go to a place that is uh, got a philosophy or belief established around a Christian format, then that's a, usually an explanation that's given for the values that underpin what services are there. The question is whether they actually underpin or whether they actually talk about what they do and not do what they talk about. What beliefs or assumption frame decision making about the care of a child or young person for whom a residential placement is sought? And how are quality service standards maintained for children and young people living and learning in this residence? Complicated, but important to give some thought to this. Last but not least is to what extent are we looking at opportunity costs and benefits? To what extent does the financial reporting of income and expenditure distinguish between human and material resources in the annual 168 hour operation of this residence? And what details are shown in cost reports? What is the opportunity and social cost benefit ratio or value added component in the outcomes produced for children and young people in the six to 12 months after leaving this residence? How does the cost of producing services for each young person while they lived here compared with compare with projected outcomes had they remained living elsewhere? Important we can argue that because what you do is very often very important with these young people. And last to think about organizational turbulence. How has the COVID-19 pandemic policy reforms budget cuts and organizational restructuring impacted on this residence over the last three years? And what impact has this had on workers and youth? How do residential care personnel, managers and others think the COVID-19 pandemic and organizational turbulence might impact on the standard and continuity of services produced by this center in the next 12 to 18 months? And what may be required? I know these are complicated, All right. Thank you very much, Donald. Nice to see you again. Uh, just going to take me a moment to share my screen. Uh, I need screen sharing, please. Donald, I need to be able to share my screen, please. Thank you. Yeah. OK, thank you. Please go ahead if you are able to share on your side. Thank you. I just need to, uh, unlike some of my colleagues, I'm not a, as good at this kind of thing as they are. Um, I, I think it's a wonderful thing that uh, Leon's awake there in uh, New Zealand uh, late at night. I'm awake here in Montreal early in the morning, and the NACCW people are all awake in the middle of the day. This uh, conference really is spanning the globe, and it's really, um, it's, it's very much a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. Um, as some of you know, I spend much of my time talking about uh, making moments meaningful. And usually when I talk about making moments meaningful, I have a particular focus on uh, outcomes. But we are living in difficult times. We're living in tough times, in troubled times. And so today I want to talk about making moments meaningful in a slightly different manner than I might normally do so. Normally, when we talk about making moments meaningful, we talk about things like this. 
Um, how can we connect this moment with this young person, this moment that we're in together? How can we connect this moment to the goals that we've established together with the young person with whom we work? How can this moment be one small step on a pathway to a healing or a pathway to a, a new way of being in the world? And normally this is the focus, but but because we are in these times, these, these difficult times, these troubling times, these challenging times, I want to take a, a slightly different focus because the challenges that surround us today are the context within which we engage with young people. And we know that every engagement with a young person occurs in a particular context. And for us today, the context are these tough times within which we live. And so we wonder, I wonder, how can I make this moment with this young person meaningful in and of itself, regardless of the goals that we're working towards? And so I ask myself the question, how can this moment be a moment of meaningful connectedness with the young person? And these tough times these challenging times, they demand of us that we help to create meaningful moments of connectedness with young people. And, and before I go further, I want to reflect just for a few minutes and ask myself the question, for whom are these times troubling? Because it seems to me that with the young people that I've met over the years, for many of those children, their life is contextualized by troubled times. They uh, live in periods of loss, of grief, of abuse, of pain. And so their times are very frequently, constantly troubled. And so I think that in some ways, the, the challenges that we face today, the, these uh, things that we call troubling times may be, may be tougher for us than it is for them. Um, and so in these uh, tough times, we need to attend uh, not only to other but also to self. Making moments, meaningful moments of connectedness. Interpersonal connectedness exists in what I like to call the co-created in between between us. This uh, small diagram shows self and other and, and the place where we connect together in what we call the relationship the in-between between us. And it's in this interpersonal in-between that the opportunity exists for us to create meaningful moments of connectedness. And as these moments occur, this in-between between us becomes more and more co-created and uh, co-defined. So how do we create meaningful moments for young people? And I want to say that because of how you know the young people, you work with them on a day-to-day -day basis, you engage with them as they live their lives, you're involved in all aspects of their experiencing. And because of that, you know the young people well. And because you know the young people well, you will know what for each individual young person might be a meaningful moment. For some, a powerful moment may be just a moment of laughter together with you. For another, it may be simply a moment of peace where the turmoil of their life can be set aside for just a moment. For others, it may be experiencing that they are loved or cared for just in this moment. For others, it may be a moment of learning, developing a new skill, acquiring a new insight, for someone else, it might simply be a moment of wonder, like when you sit outside at night and glance at the stars, or when you watch the tide come in, or even simply watch the wind blow the leaves on the trees. And for others, a meaningful moment might simply be a moment of being together with you in, in a peaceful, caring space. Just this one little moment is all I'm talking about. I'm not talking about something that might last for 10 minutes. I'm talking about something that might pass in a minute or sometimes even in seconds where we have this brief moment 
with another person where they might experience things like laughter, peace, love, learning, wonder, and being. And, and how do we create these moments or how do we promote these moments? Well, our field, our approach, our way of being in the world with other that we call a child and youth care approach gives us some guidance. We create these moments by being with young people, engaging with them, not doing to them, not standing back from them and telling them what to do, but being with them in the moment, engaging with them where they are whether that be with their pain or with their joy or with their confusion or just with their wonder. And in this brief moment, we enter into what Edna, uh, Edna Gutman has called the flow of experiencing. We engage with them in their experience as they are having that experience. And we do this by being with them, by being present with them, that in this moment with you, I am only with you. All other things are cast aside for this brief moment of connectedness between you and I. And so we like to say that in this moment of connectedness, when I am with you, I am with you. So here's my new focus in these troubled times. In these times, like all times, of course, young people need moments of meaningful connectedness. And because of how you know them, you are able to help them have these special moments, these moments of joy, these moments of learning, these moments of connectedness. Or now let me introduce what for some of us is a relatively new idea, and that is the idea of moments of mattering. <clears throat> Making moments a moment to remember through mattering. I'd like you all to look at this sentence. Often I'm asked, is it okay to tell young people that we love them? And like many of you, I struggle for an answer because it depends on the where and the how and the whom. But look at these two sentences. The first one says, I love you. The second one says, you matter. And now let's note this. In the sentence, I love you, it's all about me. It's about how I feel towards you. So I am the subject of this sentence. Whereas in the statement, you matter, you are the subject. This statement is about you. You matter to me. You matter to us. And moments of mattering, whatever they look like, they might be a moment of recognition, a moment of appreciation, uh, a slight touch on the shoulder, a nod, a smile. These moments say, I hear you, I see you, I care about you. And it's these moments of mattering in the midst of troubled times that offer us a different way to think about this. Because in these moments of mattering, in these moments of connectedness, we can help young people feel just for this moment that in these tough times, you are special and you are uh, unique. And so when we come to the uh, end here of my short time with you, I, want, I would like you to take away this. During our day, no matter what the focus of the day is, no matter how many struggles we encounter, no matter how much we strive together to get through the day and come out feeling okay, we need, as someone once said, to help young people experience at least one moment of joy during their day. And so if you can help a young person for just one moment, feel like they matter, then indeed they end up feeling special. And even in these troubled times, to feel, feel special just for a moment can go a long way. I thank you for letting me be here with you today. It's uh, been a pleasure for me. I 
am uh, fortunate to have these connections with you. And uh, while it may have taken me 10 or 15 minutes to talk about a single moment, I again want to leave you with the thought that when we make moments matter, we tell young people that they are important, that they are unique, that they are special. And through mattering, they experience our caring. Thank you very much. I'm finished for today. I, I salute you with my South Africa cup. Thank you.